Our first keynote speaker is Professor Greg Chaitin from IBM Watson Research Center from New York. And his Alan Turing lecture, he will give us an Alan Turing lecture on computing and philosophy. Uh, and the title is Epistemology as Information Theory from Leibniz to the Omega Number. And I would just like to tell you a few words why I invited Professor Chaitin to hold this uh, lecture. For me, Professor Chaitin is sort of Renaissance figure like uh, Leibniz or people who, who try to, to, to synthesize the worldview of their time. So he is a physicist. He is a mathematician, computer scientist, and a philosopher. What more can we ask for? <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to, to, to listen to this lecture. Please, Professor Chatting. Yes. Thank you very much, Gordana. <laughs> that was uh, awfully sweet of you. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be back in Sweden. Uh, I love these. Uh, these long days, uh, the summer in Sweden is so beautiful. I uh, haven't been here for a while. Uh, the, my only complaint is we're a little bit too far south. Uh, but, um, and I'm also, I'm also delighted and honored uh, to be asked to give the Alan Turing lecture. Um, uh, I enorm as I'll explain later, I enormously admire his 1936 paper. And I'm going to start by discussing his 1936 paper. But um, to go back to the beautiful Swedish summer, one is tempted here with these long days uh, just to, uh, how do you say, just to enjoy, right? I was uh, drinking beer in the, in the main square uh, uh, at midnight uh, yesterday, and there was still light, and it was so beautiful. I'm sorry? Oh, I was lucky. <laughs> it's the main square, Stora Torg, something like that. Yeah, anyway, um, but, but human beings are not satisfied with mere enjoyment. We want to understand, right? And um, in this part of the world, there were myths that explained how things worked. Uh, in ancient Greece, they, they, you know, Plato and the rational viewpoint, uh, another approach to understanding is uh, myths, creation myths, myths explaining the world. In this part of the world, I understand it was Tor, right? And Tor and Odin and the Norse gods. So I'm going to give you a, a, a myth. Uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a story. In other words, uh, what, what I have to offer you uh, very tentatively is a, a piece of speculative metaphysics. It's a système du monde uh, based on the computer. And of course, any time one makes a système du monde, you are basically inventing a myth, a story, and forcing every, ignoring everything that doesn't fit into that story. OK, so uh, I'm well aware of that. And so this is offered very much as a uh, narrative or a, or a myth of, of how to view the world, which we always understand is partial. So let me go back to Turing's 1936 paper. Um, That paper looks, I think, increasingly like a watershed, a dividing line. Um, um, and that paper looks bigger and bigger with every passing year, it seems to me. This is, uh, this is uh, Turing's paper on computable numbers with applications to the Entscheidung problem. Um, now, what Turing discusses in this paper are computable real numbers. Compute real numbers. And you remember that a real number is something like pi equals 3.1415926, going on forever. And of course, everyone knows that modern computers do not compute real numbers uh, because real numbers have the problem that they have an infinite number of uh, digits. And computers can only do calculations with finite precision. So um, Turing, nevertheless, is discussing computable real numbers. And um, um, this paper, I, 
I claim now is a fundamental paper on philosophy. It's a fundamental paper in physics. Um, to talk about, to begin to talk about the philosophical impact of this paper, I would claim uh, that you understand something only if you can program it. Uh, I'm a theoretician. As far as I'm concerned, Turing created the computer in 1936 with this paper. Actual physical machines is a small engineering problem. That's irrelevant conceptually or philosophically. Okay, so, so I would claim that, and I'll talk more about this, to understand something means you can program it, and I'll say much more about this. You can program something if you can understand it. You understand something only if you can, you can program it. And I'll say much more about that. And on the other hand, I view this as a, so this is the question of epistemology, really. And on the other hand, um, this is physics or ontology, there is the, the, I view this as a paper on physics, because Turing is talking about machines. Now we call it a Turing machine, Turing didn't call that in his paper, but he's talking about the power of machines, calculating machines, engines. And that's really, it's now recognized, I think, by physicists that this is a paper, by some physicists, that this is a paper on physics. Because the way a physicist would put it, what we can compute depends on the laws of physics in your universe. And by saying that a Turing machine is what you can compute in this universe, you are saying something very fundamental about the universe that you're in. So this is a fundamental paper on theoretical physics, which was not recognized at the time, probably. And if you want to pursue that direction, one... One, uh, one very large group that is pursuing these ideas are people who work on what's called quantum computing and quantum information theory. And they say, well, Turing's paper was wonderful, but the, or David Deutsch is one name you could mention. The physical universe actually is not classical, it's quantum mechanical, and therefore uh, Turing, uh, Turing should have had a quantum mechanical Turing machine, and these people go ahead and do that. And, uh, Okay, so, so this is a physics paper, I would claim. So I'm going to, uh, these will be the two parts of my talk in a way. So let me go back to Turing's original paper. The very interesting idea is that Turing, oh, so let me say that what I'm going to present is, uh, I would call it digital philosophy or digital physics. And this term was invented by, actually, Ed, Ed, Edward Fredkin. <sighs> digital philosophy, digital physics. Um, there are a, a number of us working in this area, you know, more or less kindred spirits, each with a different flavor. I would say that Stephen Wolfram is another person who belongs to this school. In my opinion, he probably considers that he is a school of one. <laughs> but uh, Edward Fredkin has a website with a lot of papers and books uh, that have not been published, unfortunately, on paper, but he has a large website, which is something like digital philosophy or digitalphysics.org, I believe. There's a lot of interesting material there. Stephen Wolfram, of course, has this very fat book called A New Kind of Science, which a lot of people have said is not new and is not a science book, but I think it's an interesting book nevertheless. It's maybe too big a book. I view it as a book on philosophy, actually. Uh, uh, as I'll explain. And I have my own version of this, um, which I explain in a book with a title that may seem a bit comic book, a comic book kind of title, Metamath! Exclamation mark. This title was intended for the American market. Uh, in Europe, one would never call a, a book a silly title like this. It's nevertheless a serious book, I assure you. This book you can get on 